working conditions in the early days of colonisation in Australia were nothing like they are today. Most people work 12 hours a day and often seven days a week. Manual labour of all kinds was backbreaking and took place in harsh conditions and without any of the health and safety measures we take for granted. Wages were poor and as a result, children of the labouring classes were required to begin working at an extremely early age. The Masters and Servants Act of 1837 made it an offence for a worker to break an agreement they had made with an employer, either verbally or in writing. Workers who were deemed guilty of neglecting or refusing to do the, the agreed work or taking leave without permission could, at the discretion of a magistrate, be committed to up to six months in prison and to solitary confinement and could be made to forfeit all or part of the wages owed to them. Clearly there was a lot for workers to be unhappy about. Indeed, records suggest that at least 25 strikes took place in South Australia between 1836 and 1850. The best known of these was the Borough Copper Miners' Strike of 1848. In this period, strike action violated the Masters and Servants Act, and the coming together of groups of workers to plan such action was illegal. Even though it was illegal, about 400 unions were formed in Australian colonies between 1850 and 1869. These early unions represented craft-based workers such as stonemasons, carpenters and shoemakers, as well as workers such as shop assistants, labourers and miners. In 1876, South Australia became the first territory in the British Empire, excluding Britain, to legalise trade unions with the introduction of the Trade Union Act. Now that these collectives were legal, it made sense that the various union groups should come together and in 1884 the United Trades and Labour Council was established. In 1889 Mary Lee, an active campaigner for women's rights who had played a central role in women's suffrage, asked the United Trades and Labour Council to support a women's trade union and the following year the Working Women's Trade Union of South Australia was formed with Mary Lee as secretary and Augusta Zaddo as treasurer. So many of the things we take for granted and that are now enshrined in law were hard fought for and secured by trade unions. These are just a few. In 1856, stonemasons in Melbourne demanded and won a reduction of hours from 10 hours a day to eight hours a day with no loss of pay. This was the beginning of a widespread movement to regulate the length of the working day. During protests that took place across Australia, union members carried banners featuring three intertwined eights that represented the ideal they were fighting for. Eight hours work, eight hours rest, and eight hours for recreation and education. The eight hour day was not achieved nationally until the 1920s. The second thing that unions have achieved are awards. Today we have legally binding documents that set out minimal entitlements for every workers in every industry and we call these awards. This was not always the case. In 1907, in response to union demands, the Harvester Judgment set a minimum wage for unskilled labourers of two pounds, two shillings a week. This was deemed to be the amount an average worker required to provide food, shelter and clothing for himself and his family. As such, it was referred to as a family wage. While this was an important step towards regulating wages and tackling worker exploitation, it did not apply to women workers. The minimum wage also didn't apply to all male workers. Up until the late 1960s, and in some cases beyond, Aboriginal pastoral workers earned considerably less than white stockmen, and sometimes nothing at all. 
This was justified on the grounds that station owners provided food and accommodation for Aboriginal communities, including those unable to work. Awards also set out other entitlements which have been won by unions, so things like sick leave, paid annual leave, and meal and rest breaks. Until 1969, women workers in Australia were by law paid 75% of the male wage for performing the exact same job as their male colleagues. This was because men were assumed to be supporting a family on their wage. It was not until 1972 that an equal minimum wage was granted to all Australians regardless of their sex. The long-fought battle by unions and women's groups for equal pay is, however, ongoing, and the gender gap is yet to be closed. Unions continue to play an important role in maintaining the gains that have been made for Australian workers over the last couple of centuries. However, it's been estimated that in 2018, only 17% of Australian workers belong to a union. That's a drop of 10% since 2005. Whether this will change and how it will impact on working life in the future is yet to be seen.